This evening, uh, we're looking at Psalm 119, at least one of the portions of this psalm. The psalm is one of the longest, uh, well, certainly I think the longest psalm, and certainly one of the longest chapters, if not the longest in the Bible, broken up under the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but each one of these sections having to do with something with regard to the law of God. We're going to look at just the first one that speaks about the blessing upon the one who will do all that the Lord commands us to do. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Would you listen carefully as I read this? This is the word of God. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Again, may God bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. And again, let me just say by way of preface, uh, as you know, there is broadly within the, uh, the church, the broad evangelical church, this uh, seeming allergy to the law of God, the idea that uh, if, if you say we have to keep it, or if you try to keep it, you're basically becoming a legalist, uh, you're destroying the gospel, uh, you're, you're actually going to end up condemning yourself because, again, the Lord condemns the idea that we're going to save ourselves so that we can do anything at all to contribute to our salvation. Let me say this evening, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about how a person can be saved because we know a person can only be saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking here about what's called evangelical obedience. Uh, what the Lord has saved us for, what he wants us to do with our lives. I mean, he has uh, saved us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light for a reason. And that is that we might become like Jesus Christ, that we might be obedient servants, that we might love him and love others, which is what the law of God is all about. And the Lord promises blessing if we will keep his commandments. So though we may all be in the kingdom of heaven through faith in Jesus, we will all experience the blessings of God depending on the degree to which we keep his commandments, which is why it's important we understand. The Lord calls us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lusts, or in other terms, obey universally what the Lord calls you to do and leave no room in your life for disobedience. The, the Bible expresses it in many different ways, but that's, is, that's what he's driving at. That's what he wants us to do. Now, again, as we've been progressing through this study, we have seen a number of things. I'll, I'll just simply mention what we saw last week. And that is that if you and I are to overcome any one sin, that you have to fight against every sin. I mean, not only does the Lord call you to do this, not only is it commanded, but in in reality, you really can't overcome any one sin if you leave room in your life for any sin. You have to fight against all of them. And the reason is simply this, that every sin basically springs from a common root. And that root is the corruption that is in your heart. Now, if you try to uh, cut off just one expression of that corruption in your heart, of that root, if you just try to defeat one of those sins, but you indulge in other sins that feed the root, then it's going to strengthen the root that is basically feeding the whole tree, that root that feeds every sin. So you might try to defeat one sin, by, but, indulging, but by indulging in another sin, you're actually strengthening the root which gives birth to all the sins in your life. You have to seek to kill the root. You have to fight against sin generally, all sin, if you're going to have progress, really, in defeating any one of them. 
And let's not forget as well that if you don't fight against every sin, then you really don't have what you need to defeat any of them, which is hatred of sin. If you don't hate sin, you're not going to be able to overcome it. You have to hate all sin. And certainly if you hate sin, if you hate sin at all, you're going to hate every sin. You can't just hate one sin or nine out of ten, because if there is one that you love still, you're not willing to give it up, then you really don't hate sin. The nine that you think you hate, you really are trying to give up for some other reason other than the fact that it's sin. But you see, if you don't hate sin, you're not going to be able to overcome it because your heart is not going to be able to let go of it. You must hate sin. Now, if you don't hate sin, it means you don't have the Holy Spirit, which means you don't have, of course, what you need to overcome sin because if you had the Holy Spirit, even though you would still have desire in your heart for sin. I mean, we all grant that uh, that is certainly the case. Otherwise, Christians would never sin. But you also hate it. Christians have a love-hate relationship, as it were, with sin. Uh, we love it by nature. We come into this world loving sin. And that's something, sadly, we will always have some degree of as long as we are in the world. But when the Spirit of God comes into your heart, he puts in your heart a hatred for sin, and that is what you need in order to overcome it. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't have that hatred, and if you don't hate sin, you're not going to be able to overcome it. So if that's the case with you, you need to pray and ask the Lord to give you His Holy Spirit to save you and to implant within your heart that love for righteousness, which will also give you a hatred for sin. And let me just mention uh, to those of us this evening who do hate it, one other thing we saw is the fact that we need to learn to hate it even more. Uh, the more we hate it, the more, of course, we're, we're going to want to get rid of it. And the way that we can hate it more is by remembering what it costs Jesus in order to break the power of sin in our lives and to cleanse you of your sins. He had to endure the wrath of God on the cross. He paid a tremendous price to set you free, and for that reason, you should hate every single sin that you're tempted to and that you commit, realizing it costs the one that you claim to love more than anything else his life. So when you see Christ on the cross, learn to hate sin more in order to overcome it. Now this evening, we're going to consider the other side of the coin just as the scripture calls you to put off every sin, it also calls you at the same time to put on everything that the Lord commands. You really can't overcome sin unless you fight against all sin. And in the same way, you really can't grow in obedience unless you are willing to put on all obedience to do everything that the Lord commands. Now, not only does the Lord command you to obey all of his commandments and not just some of them, the only way that you can actually strengthen your desire to keep any one of them is by seeking to keep all of them. Because by keeping all of them, you're going to strengthen the grace in your heart that is actually the root of your obedience. You know, we have two roots in our hearts, you might say a root from which springs all of our disobedience, which is our corruption, and the root from which springs all of our obedience, which is the Spirit of God. The point is you need to weaken the one and strengthen the other if you are to grow into the likeness of Christ, if you are to grow in your obedience, grow in your love, grow in holiness. And that is the goal of the Christian life. It's why the Lord saved us. So this evening, let's consider three things. First of all, the Lord does, in fact, call us or command us or require us to keep all of his commandments, not just some of them. And second, that if you keep all his commandments, it will strengthen your desire to serve the Lord in every area. We might call that a virtuous circle. And third, that if you do keep his commandments by way of incentive, the Lord promises, he promises that he will bless you. Not the least of which, of course, is the blessing of having a greater love for him greater desire to serve him. 
which ultimately in every way will lead to your benefit, to your blessing, to your profit. And um, certainly self-love will dictate that that's the direction we'll want to go if we really see the truth of these things and really want these things. So first of all, the Lord requires you to keep all of his commandments. The psalmist here is speaking of the Lord's blessing on those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord, who do no unrighteousness. Now, we can start by asking the question, how can anyone be blameless except they walk in all the ways of the Lord, except they keep all the commandments of God? If you keep only some of them but not all, you cannot be said to be blameless. How can one walk in the law of the Lord if he doesn't walk in its entirety or in the whole of it? How can you do no unrighteousness and at the same time break even one of his commandments? You see the, the strong implication here that the Lord would have us to keep them all and not just some. Now the psalmist further says in verse 4 that the Lord has ordained his precepts that they should not only be kept, but that they should be kept diligently. And again, how can one be said to diligently keep the commandments of God if there are certain commandments that you are not willing to keep? He further prays that his ways may be established to keep God's statutes. And again, is he asking that the Lord might establish his feet in only some of the commandments to keep them just in part or the whole? Well, again, note the results that he said would take place if the Lord answers this prayer, that he would no longer feel shame when he reads the law of God. Now, how can you read the law and not feel ashamed unless you keep all the commandments. So you really can't be said to be blameless, and you can't be said to be uh, diligently keeping the commandments of God or that your ways are established in his statutes, nor can you read them without being ashamed if you're not keeping all the commandments. If you're keeping perhaps only eight or nine of them rather than all of them. And by the way, the Ten Commandments is a summary of everything the Lord would have us to do. So when we say we need to keep the Ten Commandments, we're not saying that all the other commandments in Scripture are unimportant. They all simply express or explain what the Ten Commandments require. Now, it's certainly true that when you're taking a ten-question test, that you can pass the test by answering eight correctly or only nine but in this case, 80% or 90% isn't really passing. The Lord says if you break any of them, it's going to weaken you. The goal is to get 100%, especially when you consider what James says in James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. <clears throat> the Lord wants us to keep all of his commandments and again, this becomes even clearer when you consider the relationship that exists between obedience and sin. The two are mutually exclusive. There's really no overlap between them. They are complete opposites to one another. Now, if the Lord commands you to put off every sin, which we know that he does, make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lust, at the same time, he is commanding you to put on all obedience or to obey every commandment put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin, which we're to put off, is the breaking of the commandments. And of course, obedience is the keeping of them. So again, the point is God wants universal obedience to all of his commandments. Now secondly, if you will, will obey the Lord in everything, it will strengthen your desire to serve the Lord in every area. And this is kind of the flip side of the principle we've already seen because we saw with regard to sin that giving into any one sin strengthens the root of sin and so it strengthens all the fruits of sin. Well, the same thing is true with regard to obedience. However, there is a difference in this case. With obedience, you have to obey all of them. 
if you're going to strengthen any one of them. Because obeying one commandment isn't going to strengthen the, the root of obedience if you're not obeying the others. Because by not obeying the others, you're strengthening the root of sin. And that will work against your obedience. But if you obey all of them, then you're not only cutting off the things that otherwise would strengthen the root of sin, but you're also in more fully yielding to the Spirit of God, you are placing yourself in a position where the Spirit of God will give to you greater strength. In other words, you will be strengthening the root of your obedience, which is the Spirit's influence within your heart. Again, the root of all of your sin is your flesh. The root of all your obedience is the Spirit. Now, you might think of you know, this spark of goodness that's in me that's left over and so forth. I hope you don't think of that, or I hope you don't think that that's what it is. When we come into this world, we really have no desire for what is good. That's what the Bible says. There is none who does good. There is not even one. God has to implant within our heart that desire, that new nature. And that new nature is not something separate from God. It is actually the Holy Spirit dwelling within your heart. So you have these two principles at work. Again, the spirit and the flesh, the root of obedience and the root of disobedience. What will weaken one will strengthen the other. And what strengthens one will weaken the other. Whenever you give in to any one sin, you strengthen your flesh. And you grieve the Spirit of God. And you lose something of His precious influence. And the, the result is that your desire to sin will be stronger. And your desire to obey will be weaker. But if you cut off every sin, which is the same thing as obeying every commandment, you will not only weaken the flesh, but you will strengthen the influence of the Spirit of God in your hearts. Because not only will you not be grieving Him and quenching His work, but He will be giving you greater strength to obey Him. So when you sin, you're basically creating this vicious downward spiral, the one that we all need to avoid. But when you obey, again, universally, you're entering into a virtuous circle, one that spirals upward. But you have to obey every commandment for that to take place if you are to move upward in holiness, if you are to grow. So it only takes one sin to cause the root of the sin to grow, your corruption to become stronger. It takes universal obedience to the commandments of God in order to grow in holiness. Because if you're not obeying universally, you're sinning, which means you're strengthening the root of sin. You've got to cut off all sin, stop feeding that root. As one person put it, you know, sin and grace are, are like uh, two dogs, and the one that you feed the most is the one that's going to win when the two fight. Uh, as John Owen puts it, you know, it's, sin is like a beast in the room and you've got to kill it. You've got to put it to death or it's going to kill you. You have got to feed your soul on the means of grace. And we're going to look at that in the future. But at the same time, this is one of the main ways in which you retain the grace God has given to you and you gain more grace. And that is through obedience that will strengthen that grace within you and it will not give the advantage to your sin. So God requires obedience, not just to nine of the 10, not just to eight of the 10, not just a part of the commandments. It's, it's a package, it's an all or nothing thing. Sin is not an option, remember. And if you keep all the commandments, you will grow stronger. It's only by compromising that you grow weaker and that you have those battles that you have with your flesh. So finally, let's look at an incentive to do what the Lord calls us to do. If you keep all the commandments, he will bless you, which is in essence the same thing as saying that if you keep the commandments of God, you will grow stronger spiritually. But there is more. There is certainly more. Now, I thought it would be interesting just to contrast this from, oh, maybe the idea that seems to exist in some churches, at least in some branches of uh, Protestantism, you know, the idea that the Lord will bless us if we take a particular path. Um, 
such as the church I grew up in, which I think is a, is a grand illustration of an abuse of this principle. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother attended an interdenominational full gospel health and wealth church. I think I've shared that with a number of you. And every week we were told that in order to receive God's blessings, at least everything that God has to give us, there's really two things you needed to do. You needed to have faith and you needed to give. If you wanted more wealth, if you wanted more finances and so forth, then you had to give more of your wealth and then God would give back to you. If you wanted to be healed or if you wanted anything else, you basically needed faith. You needed more faith. And if you had enough faith, if you believed strongly enough, you would experience God's blessings. Now, consequently, if you didn't have enough faith, if you didn't give enough, you could expect not to be healed or to remain sick and not be very well to do. You had to give to get. You had to have faith to receive. Now, the Bible does teach us that if we are faithful to honor the Lord from the first of our increase, if we are faithful to tithe to him, the Lord will bless us financially. The Lord will meet all of our needs. The Lord will do abundantly beyond all we can ask or think. Actually, it's exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think. But we have to give in a way that gives honor to him, looking to his promise that he said he would do because he is faithful. Now, the Lord's not going to bless us if we give in order to receive, if greed is at the root of our giving. Uh, one thing we need to remember that oftentimes the reason why we want money is not only to have the things that we want, but it's also that we might feel secure that somehow if I have money, it will take care of all of my needs and I don't have to trust in the Lord as much. I mean, whenever a difficulty arises in your life, it usually means it's going to cost you something. You immediately look to your bank account to see whether or not you have enough to, to, to pay for that. Instead of looking to the Lord, you realize if you don't have uh, the finances, it forces you to look to the Lord. So there are reasons why the Lord doesn't make us all rich and why he doesn't want us to prosper that much financially because he wants us to look to him to meet our needs. With regard to faith, uh, the faith to receive God's blessings, we do need to remember that faith does need to have an object. You can't just you know, ask the Lord for anything you want and expect to receive it if you have a strong enough faith, which is, again, what they, they teach in those churches. You do have to have faith to look to God, but you need to have a promise that God makes to look to. And, you know, to tell you the truth, the Lord has really nowhere promised in the Bible to heal all your sicknesses, regardless of your circumstances. Uh, there are saints in the Bible who were not healed by the Lord. For instance, Paul seems to have had an issue with his eyesight, and the Lord didn't heal that. He said to the Galatians, you know, that that if I had needed it, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And you look at a passage like that and you think, what in the world is Paul talking about? How would their plucking out their eyes and giving them to Paul help him in the slightest, except that Paul had some problem with his eyes? Uh, Timothy apparently had certain problems with his stomach and other areas of his body, of his health. And so Paul says to him, no longer drink just water, but take a little wine for your stomach and your frequent ailments. It's not always God's will that you be made well from your illnesses. I mean, the Lord brings these things into your lives for a reason. And it's always a good reason. And until that purpose for that particular illness in your life is fulfilled, until the Lord works that good thing, he's not actually going to heal you. Now, that's, that's one answer to the health and wealth teaching, but there's another one that they overlook and that really dovetails with what we're looking at this evening, and that is how do you actually gain the blessing of God? And, well, what is the blessing of God is another question we could ask. Is it simply having lots of money? Not necessarily. Is it simply having a body that's free from, from all sickness? Well, again, not necessarily. It really has to do, of course, with growth in holiness and spiritual blessings and storing up treasures in heaven and so forth. 
But how do you get the kind of faith that you need in order to receive the things that God actually does promise you? Because again, the kind of faith that they are usually talking about amounts to nothing but selfishness. If you want something badly enough, God will give it to you if you just simply ask and keep on asking and believing that he's going to give it to you until he does. Now that's not what the Bible refers to as faith. That isn't faith. The kind of faith you need doesn't come from selfishness and it doesn't come from just hoping God's going to answer you know, a prayer because you've asked for something or for asking, from asking him a thousand times a day for something that you want or even believing that he's going to answer your prayers. Faith, this kind of faith, to receive the blessings of God comes from obedience. Obedience. If you obey, as I've already mentioned, it keeps you from grieving and quenching the Spirit of God, who is trying to lead you in the commandments of God. It keeps the sin in your heart from growing stronger. It brings more of the Spirit's presence. The more that you have of the Spirit, the stronger your faith is going to be. And the stronger your faith is, the more you're going to be able to look to the Lord and receive his promises. Again, look at what the psalmist writes in verses 1 and 2. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. Consider what Psalm 1 says. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The way or the path of blessing is not, again, by asking God for things you want, or by giving to him in order to receive, but rather it comes by seeking to honor him by obeying his commandments, by putting him first. If you do that, then the Lord says you'll be blessed, which means not only that you will be happy, that you will have a joy that will transcend all of your difficulties so that no matter what you're going through, you will be blessed, but you will also, of course, see many more answers to your prayers because you will pray with a stronger faith, with a much sharper and clearer focus on God's glory rather than your own, and you will see the answers to those prayers. The way to the Lord's blessing, again, is not through these other ways, but it is found in the path of his commandments. I thought that... Um, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 6, brings that out about as clearly as you can imagine. And again, what I believe that God promised to his covenant people in the Old Testament is, is true as well today. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 6. The Lord said through Moses to his people, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. And again, it goes on and on talking about the different blessings that the Lord will have for you. Where does spiritual blessing come from? It doesn't come from just simply praying and asking. It doesn't come in these other paths that, that we talked about. So again, the health and wealth movement would say giving and having this kind of faith. I think most evangelical churches would say pray. You know, there was, not too long ago, there was a um, book that circulated called the, pray, the Prayer of Jabez. And it was simply based upon, I think it was just a couple verses in Scripture where Jabez uh, said one day, Lord, bless me, and the Lord blessed him. 
And so somebody wrote a book on that. This is how you gain the blessing of the Lord is you just simply pray and ask. Now, you do need to pray and you do need to ask. But if your life is not one of submission to all the commandments of God, if you're not seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, if you're allowing yourself to sin and strengthening the root of that sin and rather than the, the root of obedience by honoring the Lord, you really can't expect the Lord to answer your prayers. You really can't take hold of those promises. The Lord tells us that if you regard any sin in your heart, that the Lord will not hear you when you pray to him, which doesn't mean he doesn't you know, know what you're saying. He does hear you in that sense, but what it means is he won't listen to you. The Lord will honor those who honor him. So in order basically to enjoy the blessings of God, which include, again, happiness, uh, joy, fullness of joy, even in difficult circumstances. We talked about this morning the fact that if you obey the Lord, if you are a servant of the Lord, you may suffer. But in your sufferings, you'll actually find a greater joy and happiness of, actually, you know, of being in the Lord's place and taking the abuse that is meant for him, even as he stood in your place and took the abuse that was meant for you. You'll, you'll find that kind of joy. You'll find that all your needs will be met. Your physical needs as far as your health to the degree God wants you to be healthy. Your financial needs to the degree that he wants you to prosper. Again, realizing that he doesn't want to make you rich so that you don't forsake him. Again, remember what one of the um, writers in the Proverbs said. You know, Lord, don't give me uh, so little that I'll be tempted to steal, but don't give me so much that I'll be tempted to say, who is the Lord? Because I'm trusting my riches rather than you. Uh, you can expect that God will meet your needs here on earth, that he will provide everything that you need. And you can also, of course, expect that the Lord will grant to you that place of honor we were talking about this morning. If you will submit to all his commandments and do what the Lord calls you to do, if you're willing to obey, if you're willing to suffer, the Lord will bless you and honor you throughout eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. The path that leads to these blessings, which I hope all of us want, is of course trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to do that to get on the path at all, but it is walking in the path of obedience. So if you've ever struggled in any of these areas and wondered why the Lord isn't meeting those needs, you do need to ask yourself the question, am I doing what it is God calls me to do? Am I putting off all my sin, making no provision for that? And am I putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, not just parts of his life, but am I seeking to do all that he commands me to do? This is, in this case, the Lord wants all. He wants everything. Any area you compromise is going to weaken you. Any area you compromise is going to dishonor the Lord, strengthen the root of sin, and make you struggle. It has to be all. Years ago, I was... Um, having my taxes done at, uh, I forget the name of the, of the establishment now, the, the person I think has since retired, but he himself was a believer and uh, he had this exciting discovery that he wanted to share with me. He goes, I've discovered the secret of the victorious Christian life. And I was thinking to myself, that's interesting, I wonder what he has to say. You know, is it going to be the, you know, just have enough faith, is it going to be just pray or whatever it may be? But no, actually he said, Obey God's commandments. And you know what? He was right. That is the secret to the Lord's blessing, which is really no secret. It's shot all throughout Scripture. It's the purpose behind everything that God has done is to make obedient children. Sometimes we think his purpose is simply to save us so that we can go to heaven. And that was his purpose. But he saved you for a reason. And that reason is that you would reflect his image that you would become like Jesus, that you would become living testimonies and lights in this world of what God actually wants you to be, what he wants everyone to be, what he wants them to do. That is his purpose, not just to save you, but to free you from your sins and to make you like Jesus. Again, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren, brethren who are like him. That's what a Christian is, somebody who is like Jesus. So that is 
the path he wants us to walk. And if we are willing to walk it, God will grant us his blessings. So the bottom line is obey all of God's commandments and you will be blessed. Not only will God meet your needs here, but he will meet your needs in other ways throughout eternity as you store up treasures in heaven. And you will also grow in holiness, which will not only, of course, be beneficial to you throughout eternity, but will also increase your happiness here. So again, as you are called to put off all sin, we are also called to put on all righteousness and all obedience. Now next week, we'll begin to look more carefully at how the Lord calls us to do this and what it is we can do uh, further beyond what we've already seen to strengthen the root of holiness that we might grow in these areas and experience more of the blessings of God. By the way, one of the blessings of the Lord is, is the blessing of usefulness. Being used in his kingdom, if you want to be useful, this is the path you have to take. And I hope all of us want to be useful. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to encourage us to do what he has called us to do here, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ.